Oh, this is pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope you guys are enjoying the conference so far. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Tanya. Um, so I have a few uh, characteristics to name for her. A bio. A bio. <laughs> a bio. <laughs> so the first one is a creativist, God lover, plumpish, radio girl, coffee. <laughs> Coffee craving, wife to one husband, journal writing, postmenopausal, <laughs> humor filled, often stressed, boy mom, loving and loved, broken in places, sometimes cross, PE born, Jesus following, and a non wear of purple, white, and silver. <laughs> Listen, start that clock, babies. <laughs> oh, you did so well, Rebecca. Thank you, thank you. One day I'll do your bio. So, yeah, so this, that, that's a little bit of who I am. Um, my name is Tanya Olfelt. I am the production manager at Kingfisher FM. Um, I'm sure many of you have tuned into Julius's great shows, Who Is Your Heart, and all of that. So, uh, yeah, I do production. Yeah, guys. I'm under pressure, <laughs> doing production at the station, I write radio ads, and um, most of what you're hearing on the station, if it's not Julius talking or music playing, is literally created by myself and a guy called Andile Sokaya in a little studio, little, little tiny studio um, at the back of Kingfisher. And it's a real privilege to be part of a radio station that is Christian media, but let me tell you, uh, Christian media, it's a hard, hard game. Um, and that's a whole other story. So, I don't know if you got much of that bio, but it was written from the heart. And one of the things in that bio is journal writing. So, this is it. I said to Liesl, even if I'm a non wearer of purple, white, and silver, my journal, look at it, it's all glittery. <laughs> And I did try and find purple, but I couldn't. So I kind of got trying to get close, and you guys look amazing. I'm just blown away by Liesl and her sewing. Um, so what I've done, I, generally what I do, one of the things that I do, and I've done for many years, is I've done journal writing workshops um, with women. And I've got many, many journals uh, that, that I've written into, books, on a bookshelf. And I know that at any stage I can walk up to that bookshelf, I can pull out a book, and I can find some of that bio that you just read about me in one of those books, okay? And so I'm used to workshopping and actually working with women and helping them to write down their stuff. So what I did when it came to being here is I actually just took time to write down some stuff, like in my journal, um, for you ladies, and so I'm going to be reading little excerpts and little ideas and little messages that just come out of my journal time with God. When I was around, let's say, six years old, I had this amazing auntie, my mom's younger sister, only 14 years older than me. And she used to lie in bed with me. I used to go sleep at my grand's house. She'd lie in bed with me and she'd hold me. And in the darkness, she'd tell me, her Jesus stories. Now, she had come out of a, a situation where she had actually gotten involved in seances and all of that new age stuff. And it was her thirst for God, her thirst for truth. So I don't know how many of you here are actually from the church. How many of you are from the church? And how many of you here are, have been dragged here by somebody else, have been invited? <laughs> Okay, we'll ask who's been invited by someone else, and then I'll ask you, okay, who was dragged here? <laughs> yeah, well, so, yeah, so my aunt, she would, you know, tell me her Jesus stories, and, and Jesus came alive, alive to me through her, and, you know, she had come out of a situation where she had been on a road looking for truth, and someone had invited her or dragged her to a place where she could really find truth. 
truth aside from the, the horoscopes and truth aside from the seances and the spiritism nonsense that she was actually getting herself into as she was looking for truth. And I thank God because as she lay with me and held me, her stories transformed my heart. And I actually found Jesus as a little girl. And I remember um, having this, um, my parents were kind of Catholic, and we didn't really go to church. Um, and I remember having a friend who, was, who had a born-again mother, and she was on fire, and I was about eight. And they took me to the Assemblies of God Church in uh, Lorraine. And um, I went up, and I gave my heart to the Lord. I was this little girl of eight, and there was this old man of about 80. It was, I think God must have smiled when he saw it. So um, what happened was, let's just fast forward. One of the things in my bio, it says that I was a, a Joburg fashion editor, which I was. I was part of a publishing house, a local publishing house that published out of PE. I was, uh, God has always given, every job I've ever had has been given to me by God. Um, it's just how he's worked with me. And I ended up as a fashion editor in a local publishing house. Now, in Port Elizabeth at that time, there would only have been two. It would have been myself and I think that woman, Barbara Robertson, who used to do fashion pages for the Herald or La Femme. I don't know if you guys remember that. And so anyway, this our little publishing house, we moved to Joburg. And so I was one of a handful of fashion editors in Johannesburg. Um, and I was uh, a born-again believer and I was on fire for Jesus. And I remember, you know, coming from PE and into this crazy, mad fashion world, the one photographer, and I was working with the top photographers in the country, the top models in the country. Um, the one uh, photographer said, like, what drug? What drug are you on? Like, what is it? And I, all I could say is that the drug was Jesus. But let me tell you guys, being in that publishing world was hectic. Being in the magazine industry is hectic because you are on deadline all the time, okay? And as, as the, you could, you could get that mag to print, all right? You've got to get that mag to print. And as the mag, before the mag goes to print, the next lot of deadlines have rolled in. I never took lunch hours. I had 4 a.m. wake-up calls. You know, shoot Mr. South Africa and not by the gun with a camera. Um, <laughs> I know we're all South Africans. We're going to go, what? Um, you know, in, in a field on a couch, you know, at sunrise, and it's winter. So you're in that field at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you're loading a couch off of a bucky, you know. I mean, I, 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 I worked with Richard Branson. I, I made Richard Branson run on the top of the Santon Towers. Uh, I made him play aeroplane. And I got him... <laughs> I got him polystyrene wings, and I tied rope around them, and I made him, that was when Virgin Airlines hit South Africa, you know? I was doing crazy things like that. I was in the fray of it, but I got so burnt out, and I knew the Lord said to me, listen, girl, I think the time is coming for you. It's up, and you're going to go and start having your babies, man. You know, I'd been married at, uh, at 1990, and now I was 30, and you can be eaten up. And so Jesus said, off you go. And I said to my husband, listen. I am going to go to New York. I need to go to New York. I want to go visit Washington. I want to go to America. I want to go on a holiday. And I, if I leave this job, it's so insanely intense. I can't go from this to having a baby. I am, it, was a, it, it was also a, a faith walk because I was going to go from having a salary to not because I was going to go be a, at home. So I knew our salary would half, but I had been given a little bit extra a couple of months back and I was saving it. I said, babe, I really believe I need to go to America. And he said, but my darling, I can't come with you. And I said, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to go on holiday with Jesus. And I had, I had $50 a day, a backpack on my back, 30 years old, climb on a plane, land in LA, don't know where I'm sleeping that night. Um, I had youth hostels. I went, into, I went into youth hostels. And my poor husband, he stood like waving me goodbye at Joburg Airport, like, oh, Jesus, help her. Where she go? Um, and I just want to fast forward, because you this time goes fast. Um, I just want to fast forward to a story where uh, the last part of the leg of my journey, so I actually, it was amazing. I was, um, yeah, $50 a day for everything, all right, and I hardly spoke. So I hardly spoke that, that holiday because I actually went on holiday with Jesus and my journal. And so I would go and land in a little city and not a big city, and I'd just find a coffee shop, 
write and walk and look and speak to God. I had to, I had to get the, all that stuff from Joburg. I had to kind of get it off me, okay? And last leg of my journey, I'm in New York City, and I'm in this youth hostel in Brooklyn. Now, um, Brooklyn has become pretty hip and vibey. Then, it wasn't. Uh, the, the hip vibey part, the cleanup of Brooklyn had just started at the edge where, if you're in Brooklyn, Brooklyn you actually look over and you see Manhattan, okay? Uh, the skyline. So many m movies, uh, they, they, they film from that Brooklyn bro uh, promenade. I'm in this little youth hostel, like right close to the, the Hudson River, and um, surrounded by all these international people. And the one morning, I wake up, third day there, and I've got this picture in my head of a bright yellow pencil. I'm dreaming. I've got this picture in the frontal lobe of my brain. A bright yellow pencil, sharp edge, a rubber at the back. I'm like, okay, well, okay. Don't even think about it. But something inside of me says, I want that yellow pencil. Okay? So I quickly I get ready. I go out to go get my coffee. As I'm sitting here, my coffee, I I've got to hurry with this coffee. I've got to go find a yellow pencil. It's like weird, okay? Um, I don't normally do that. So I go, okay, where, where's the stationery shop? The guy says, oh, up the road on Atlantic, which was actually a safe area. And I go and I find a stationery shop, no yellow pencils. Say to the guy, is there another stationery shop? Yes. Off I go, finding to the next stationery shop to find a yellow pencil. Eventually, there's no yellow pencil there. And I'm going, I'm in New York City. Okay. There's lots to see. What am I doing? I'm wasting my time here. I'm just like hanging around looking for yellow pencils. Am I mad? Okay, hang on. I'm just going to go to the supermarket. Go to the supermarket. There's no yellow pencil. I went, look, Tanya, you are getting on that subway and you're getting into Manhattan. And my dream had been to visit Strand Bookstore, which was the biggest secondhand bookstore in the world. I needed a book because I always journeyed, uh, traveled with a book. I'd read everything. And I just wanted to visit this. Um, it was a famous bookstore on Broadway. Take the subway land up on Broadway, try and find this place. Now, dwelling around. Look here, this is the 90s, girls. There's no Siri, okay? There's no, like, Siri, I'm lost. All right, you, you just got, like, New York people walking really fast and not wanting to talk to you. So I'm looking, I'm thinking, here I am. I've been searching for uh, more than an hour, hour and a half. I've been searching for a yellow pencil, stupid me, and now I can't find where I want to be. Get, I'm going to go back on that subway and I'm going to zoot further up the road and see if I can find this bookstore. Zoot further up the road, can't find the bookstore. Get back on that subway, zoot further down. Come out. As I come out the subway, I look and it says Broadway. Awesome. Now I'm walking. But something feels wrong. Something feels off. The neighborhood feels off. Okay? And I'm going, what, where are I? Okay, I'm on Broadway, but something's not lacquer. Now you must understand... <laughs> You know, I was a little South African girl. Um, Mandela had only come out of prison a few years prior. In LA, I'd been chucked off a bus because I, I was a white South African by this African-American guy. In America, the people that were the best to me were the African-Americans, and the people that were the worst to me were the African-Americans, okay? Um, and what I found with the African-Americans in the late 90s, that there was a, a, a weird an anger. I actually felt a palpable anger. So I'm walking down this road, and I walk past these guys, these, like, hip-hop gangster-looking dudes. And I'm like, and I'm walking, and I'm thinking, this doesn't feel good. Get to the corner, there's, like, a little gang. Yo, now I'm feeling worried. Walk, now I can't, I've got to walk. I'm walking. I'm looking for this place. I can't see numbers. Gangs. Gang guys. I'm, where am I? I'm the only whitey face, babies, on that street. Okay. And these oaks are gangsters, and they start catcalling me. And I am, you must know, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm in the middle, I'm on the globe, I'm a pinprick. My husband doesn't know where I am. There's no one back home that's going to go, why is Satonia not home yet? You know, I realize I am lost. I don't know where I am. And I look into one of the shop windows, and it says, Broadway, Brooklyn. I had taken the subway, I'd gone under the road, under the, the, the river, Okay, and I didn't know Broadway carries on across the river into Brooklyn, but now I'm not in the good part of Brooklyn. I'm in the gangster part of Brooklyn, and these oaks know I've been walking past them. They've been shouting at me, calling me. If I turn around, I'm gonna, they're going to know I'm lost. 
I, all I knew is I've got to walk confidently. Like, I, I own this joint, babies. I'm telling you now. <laughs> I, I love you. <laughs> and I don't know where I am. My heart was beating. I, my, my throat was drier than it is now. And um, I'm so take a water. I know, I've got to get off the street. And I've got to find a subway. I can't find a subway. Eventually, I go right. I'm going to hit a right. And I'm going to try and walk parallel. I hit a right. My heart's beating. Get onto the next road, parallel with Broadway. And I stop. And I say, God, because that was quite a quiet road. And I didn't see many people. I, I don't know where I am. I'm in the middle of gangland. Slumville. W help me, please, God. And I look down, and perfectly, oh, he's amazing, perfectly positioned at my feet, like it was placed there, is a yellow pencil <laughs> <laughs> with a sharp edge. Now, you know what happens to sharp-edged pencils when they drop? With a, a razor at the back, perfectly positioned at my feet. And I picked up this pencil, and I held this pencil, and I knew that God, God knows me. And I clutched that pencil, and I walked, and I promise you it wasn't even 30 seconds, and there was a subway. And I zooted down that subway, and I was on a train, and I was going back into Manhattan. And I sat holding this pencil, and it was so apt, you know, because I'm a journal writer, because I, I love words, and I said, you are my God of the yellow pencil. So from, from that day on, it's one of the, the names for, for my God is my God of the yellow pencil. And, you know, I just wrote here now, you know, he's always got something up his sleeve, this God of the yellow pencil. Okay? So let's fast forward to now. Um, I was 30, about to start my family. I just had my first boy at 33. I was a bit of a late starter, but married my husband nice and young. Um, and now I am 55, post-menopausal ladies. I won't ask you to put up your hands. You can put up your hands later. I'll ask you later. <laughs> oh, my word. Um, you know, and I said to God recently now, because as I say, being in publishing is hardcore. Being part of that radio station is hardcore. 2019, we had a hostile takeover attempt. If ever I've seen Satan alive and well, uh, I have seen it while working in Christian media. And I said to God, like middle of last month, yeah, last two weeks of July, I said, Lord, you know, I've done all these writing workshops. I'm on air with Ilana on a Friday just for a little bit, and I know that I've got stuff to say to women, you know, but I'm tired, man. I'm, I'm exhausted. 2019, wipe me out. I haven't recovered yet. I'm in recovery. And then menopause hits. Some of you know what that looks like. You suddenly wake up in one body, you know, a different body than what you had, like, <laughs> different brain. And um, I said, okay, do I actually have anything to say to women? You know, this thing of you can talk to women, is that real? Because I don't think so right now. I'm very tired. But I'm putting it out there, Lord. That's something we've spoken about. And it wasn't like, what, about a week or so later, I'm sitting at my desk and I get a little message. Will you come and chat at our ladies' conference? And I'm just like, hmm, there we go again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my God of the yellow pencil. You see, the God of the yellow pencil, what he said to me is, you know, Tanya, if I can give you what you want. How much more won't I give you what you need? I woke up wanting a yellow pencil, not a Lamborghini. No, I've never wanted one. Um, and you know what he did? He gave it to me in my time of need. And he proved to me that he's there. And how many of us are getting yellow, yellow pencils if we don't see it? We don't see the little provisions, the little ways that he talks to us. Then, Liesl, so Liesl, you're part of my story, okay? Y y honestly, it's part of my healing. Like, 2019, guys, wiped me out, and that's, we can actually have another conference maybe on Saturday. We'll talk about that one. 
Um, she, and she says, write a bio, okay? <laughs> and I just sat down. I went, okay, I'm going to write something. Now, let's relate. So I, I said I'm a creativist. Do, can any of you say that you're creativists? Anyone here? Show me, man. Come, come. Where are you? Oh, I feel at home. God lovers, show me. Who? Oh, I love it. Okay. Plumpish people. <laughs> Will all the plumpish people stand up? Okay. Um, radio girl. Anyone? There we go. Yeah. Uh -huh. Something's coming. Um, coffee craving. I didn't put chocolate craving. It's there too. Wife to one husband. <laughs> Wife to two. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you got this, but I was a one-time Navy girl. I was in the Navy straight after school, so I know how to salute. Anyone else from the Navy? The Army, the police force? There we go, babies. Okay, journal writing. Do we have journal writers? There we go. Postmenopausal woman. Now you can put up your hands. <laughs> and you younger ladies, it's stuff we need to talk to you about because you know what? We get left hanging dry. And no one tells us about the stuff. Okay. Um, humor filled. Show sure we all are. Are any of you also ex Joburg fashion editors? Because then we can talk afterwards. Um, often stressed, anyone? Hello, no water. Boy mom? I've got a 22-year-old, really cute, by the way. Um, loved and loving. Loved and loving. Broken in places. Sometimes cross. Sometimes really cross. Yeah. P.E. born. Jesus following. Okay, I said non wear of purple, white, and silver, but I will take that back. <laughs> so, you know, when, when I wrote that little thing, afterwards I had a laugh because I thought, you know what? When someone tells you to write a bio, you, you, can, you can write a bio that really glows. You know, you can go for it. You can say, I won the debating prize, you know, in, when I was in grade eight. You know, you can say everything good <laughs> that you ever won. Uh, and then you, you know what you can also do? How about if we write the bio of all of our bad stuff? What would that look like? Huh? Yeah. And then there's the other bio. There's the God of the Yellow Pencil bio. There's that bio that we can write that is the God story in our life, and not just the big God stories, the little God stories in our life. Because if we really take time to have a look, it's packed with little God stories. No matter how broken in places, no matter how plumpish, no matter how magnificently beautiful and perfect we think we are. Our bio constantly changes, you know, one day, you're writing your bio and you're newly wed. 20 years later, you might be writing your bio and you divorced again. It changes. The one day, you're going to be gloriously happy. 1975. 1995. Badly depressed. Your bio changes. And that mirror, pure mirror. How many of you sometimes don't want to look in a mirror? You're walking in Woolworths and you go like this. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> oh, you know, because you know the mirror changes. What we see in the mirror changes. The one day you might be standing looking in that mirror and you're a widow. And two years later, you might be happily married. You know, the one day you're looking in the mirror and you're 60. 20 years later, you're 80. The one day you're looking in the mirror, you're a schoolgirl. A couple of years later, baby, you're ready for the world. We've all been there. One day you're looking in the mirror, and you're going, my little kids are so amazing. 
and the next day you're going, what the heck is going on <laughs> with these teenagers? <laughs> but my challenge, listen now, I've only got 16 minutes and two seconds. My challenge is that, this is the challenge, is that as what we see in the mirror changes and as this bio changes, um, you know what? There is a God story. Okay. You're a girl with a God story. And the God story is unchanging. The God, He is unchanging. So as our bios change, as stuff hits us, as our faces change and our bodies, He's unchanging. Um. One story I'm going to miss out. I'm not telling that story. Uh, basically, I love the fact that this whole thing was about identification and how we identify ourselves. Because I just know that as women, we just have so much guilt. You know, I think the minute you have a baby, this little thing arrives and goes, Hello, I'm guilt. Pleased to meet you. I'm going to hang out with you. Well, for almost the rest of your life, it feels. <laughs> um, and, but let me tell you, ladies, it's so special to be amongst women because I've got such a heart for the fact that our womanhood is under attack. I've got a heart for women. And guys, out there in this big world, never before in the history of mankind has um, womanhood been so under attack, you know? The, the, the dictionary is, they, even ch the dictionary is changing the definition of woman. They're adding a definition that says you can, if you identify as a woman, you're a woman. Okay? You got America, they're in a mess, man. You got dudes going into toilets saying, I'm a girl. And they're not. And girls are getting raped. Stuff's going down. Our womanhood's under attack. And that just took me through to Genesis. And so I want to have a look on my phone quickly. I thought, I've got to actually just go and have a look at Genesis. So I, I went into Genesis 1. And I love this where he says, uh, God put man into a deep sleep. No, no, I want to go before that. Genesis 1. <sighs> so Genesis 1 is kind of a bit of an overview, all right? So he says, you know, that he, God created human beings. Uh, this is from the message. Reflecting God's nature creating them male and female, and God blessed them. And I love this. Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible. That's what he told us to do. Girls, that's what he said to you. Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible. Okay. And let's look at ourselves. Are we doing that? And then Genesis 2, and I love this. He, he took the man, and then he puts him in the Garden of Eden to work the ground and keep it in order. Laka, the man's out there making things happen. And he says, he looks at him, and he goes, you know what? It's not good for you to be alone. I'll make you a helper, a companion. And this is where we come in. And he forms from the dirt of the ground. But what he first did is he put the man into a deep sleep, okay? And then as he slept, he removed one of his ribs. And he replaced it with flesh, and he then used the rib that he had taken from the man to make woman, and he presented her to the man. And the man said, finally, hyo, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Name her woman, for she was made from man, and therefore, and this is a good part, a man leaves his mother and father or his father and mother and embraces his wife and they become one flesh. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked and they felt no shame. There were no mirrors. And then Genesis 3 starts. How do you think Genesis 3 starts? Mm. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made, and he spoke to the woman. Why 
Why does there always have to be a serpent? Have you seen that? There always has to be a serpent. I, as I said, I was going through a tough time in 2019. 2021 came and I was walking around in semi-zombie mode. In 2019, I had had a dream over Kingfisher. I'd woken up and I'd said to my husband, I said to the people there, something's coming. And my dream was as vivid as my yellow pencil. My dream was of a serpent. And that serpent came down the pathway of Kingfisher. It was a huge kind of um, blue serpent. It was very thick. It had little feet. Afterwards, people have said to me, okay, that's a Leviathan. But, so the serpent came through the front gate. There was an angel on either side of the gate in my dream. And the angels looked at this thing, saw it coming past, down the corridor, and it hit the door. And it writhed, and it writhed, and it writhed, and it writhed, and it writhed. But it never got in. And I said to my husband, I said, babe, something hectic's coming. Something hectic, and I don't know what it is. And I think the worst evil I've ever seen, like with my eyes, befell that station. It was fascinating. And I knew that I knew that I knew that the serpent had arrived. But I also knew that I had a god of the yellow pencil who would see my needs and see our needs. And as I said, you know, that's another story. But even in that, even when we see God there, we get hurt. Just because God's in our life doesn't mean we're not hurt. And just because God's in our life doesn't mean we don't make the right, de- you know, the right decisions. We make the wrong decisions even when Jesus is there. We get broken even when he's there. We do because we experience it, you know. The thing is we've got to get him into those places. And I'd say to the Lord, Lord, I'm hurting, man. I'm alone. I'm just left out here in the cold. You don't pursue me anymore. You know, it's like mommy and our kids, nye, 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 nye. and that was me. God, nye, 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 nye. shame, and the serpent and the evil people and everything. And anyway, so I had this problem with my shoulder, and the doctor said, look, there's this Cairo. You've got to go to this Cairo and get this problem sorted out. It's this guy you've got to go to. So I go my little bit of money, go to pay cash, and uh, go see this guy, and then I have to go again. Oh, off I go again. Sit in my little, you know, sit in the little waiting room. Sweet, two sweet little ladies behind the counter. Go in, get my shoulder, da-da-da-da, come out. Take out my purse, and the woman says, um, no, you don't have to pay. Little gray-haired old lady, sweetheart. I go, what do you mean? She goes, no, it's paid. I said, what, what, what are you talking about It's paid? Who paid it? She says, I paid it. Have you ever heard of a person like at a doctor's surgery or something paying for your bill? I'm like, you, pay, you paid for my bill? <laughs> but wh- why? She goes, no, I just paid for it. It's fine. Go. You can go. I'm like, okay, what's your name? <laughs> just why? And she goes, I'm just going to ask you one thing. Um, do you mind if I... I've got your phone number here. Do you mind if I send you a message? I went, no, that's okay. Like, I hope it's not going to be weird, but that's okay. <laughs> like, thank you. Like, you almost don't know what to do. Embarrassed. Thank you, thank you. Mwah, mwah. And off I went. Off I went. Oh, my word. Um, and so, yeah, I get home after work, and this message comes through, and it's a video. And it's by that Louis Giglio, why give the enemy a seat at your table? I'd never heard, I hardly, you know, I knew about him, but I'd never watched his stuff, this video. I, I, sat on my, I sat on my bed, I remember actually lying on my bed after that video and crying and crying and crying and going, God, I had, I had the serpent at my table again. I have been walking around with the enemy at my table again, not looking to you. Focusing on betrayal, focusing on the enemy, it's so hard. I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry. Yes, I see you. You are pursuing me. You made a little old lady at the Cairo pay for me. You got her to send me a video? You know? 
You are my God of the yellow pencil. You see my needs. And the, the bottom line is that, um, you know, there's homework for us to do, ladies. You know, as we sit here, this is not about entertainment. As we sit in church, this is not, a, that's not about entertainment. You don't go there to be entertained. It's about getting charged up so that you can go and do the work, okay? Every single one of you has a bio. And every single one of you has a mirror, the woman that you see in the mirror. And every single one of you, whether you believe in Jesus or not, you have a God story. Whether you've given your heart to the Lord or not, the reason that you're sitting here today is because you have to hear about him so that you can give your heart to him, so that you can get on with it, okay? And your homework is that you are going to go and write your bio. It can be as simple as the words that I put together, or it can be as beautiful as what Judy has put together. Because you saw what Judy brought to the table today. She brought her God stories. And what happened? You were touched and affected. Our God stories aren't meant to be kept in here. He doesn't do it so that we can just hang around feeling good. He did it so that we can go out there and be the light and be the salt. Because if we aren't going to be the light and the salt, I promise you the world is out there. Okay. And it's got aromat full of MSG. For the people. I made that up in the moment. <laughs> oh, my word. Uh, 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 uh. The thing is, you know, that if, if you don't have a God story, if you feel that you don't have a God story, or if you've been ignoring your God stories, the, I've got very good news, and that is that you can get one. You can get one right now, right here today. It's waiting for you. The only thing that's going to matter at the end of your life is not your bio, okay? It's not your, what you see in the mirror. It's not the fact that I was a fashion editor in Joburg, you know? I mean, that was just really... It's so fickle. Um, it's not the fact that um, maybe when I was 16, I was really cute, you know? My hair looked great. It's not the fact that you've got lipstick on or not, all right? I really believe that when I get to the end of my days and I've got to stand before God, that there's going to be something he's going to say to me, and he's going to say, Tonya, so what did you do with Jesus? In your brokenness, what did you do with Jesus? In your good times, what did you do with Jesus? When you were being betrayed, what did you do with Jesus? As you were breastfeeding at 3 o'clock in the morning, what did you do with Jesus? As a woman, what did you do with Jesus? And it's easy. Because when they said to me, listen, you're going to come here and preach, I'm like, hey, I, I, I don't preach. I, I do journal stuff. Um. But the bottom line is, this is not about preaching. This is about testimony. Okay. And we have got to walk in the anointing of Christ as woman. Because you saw what happened in Genesis. God made woman. And then the serpent was clever, more cleverer than any wild animal God had made. And he spoke to the woman. Are you being spoken to more by the serpent than by the word of God? Because the beautiful thing is, even if you don't fully know scripture and you can't go out there and quote it, you've got your stories. And no one can take your stories away from you. Because when Jesus walked the earth, he was full of them. You know, that's what he did with the crowd. He just went and told the stories. You know, I was sitting journaling, and I finished journeying, saying, Lord, like, well, what do I tell these ladies, you know? And I walked into the shop. I actually landed up at a shop. I was telling the ladies uh, in the back beforehand. Landed up going to the shop, needing to go buy something, and found that it had moved. And there was a new shop in its place. And I thought, hang on, let me just go check this out. And I thought, no, don't, man. Don't go into this place. I thought, listen, they've told me to wear purple. 
this is like a second-hand clothing place. I'm going to go find something purple. And um, I walk in and never been there before. And this owner arrives. And she goes, hello, hello. And all that's in my head is I've got to tell these ladies to go out there and start telling their God stories. The simple thing. I've just got to tell them. And all I could hear is God stories, God stories in my head. It was like reverbing. So this chick who owns the place comes and goes, hello, what do you want? She's walking with me, and I'm looking through this, like, rail. And she goes, you know what? I'm new. This is new. I said, yeah, it looks new. It's wonderful. It's a new shop selling beautiful secondhand stuff on Main Road Warmer. And she's like, but you know that there's a story about the shop? Do you know that I've got a story here? And I'm going, interesting story. Um, yeah, there's a story um, because, yo, I've been through a lot of stuff, but this whole shop is, there's, there's, a, there's a story. She kept on saying the word story to me, and as I'm going through the clothes, I'm going, interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, I'd written something down in my journal, and I'd written, when it came to the mirror, I'd written down, one minute you're a widow, the next minute, the next, within two years, you're happily married. And I said, God, why am I writing this? I should be writing, one minute you're happily married, within two years you're a widow. And I, I felt the Lord say, no. One minute you're a widow, two years later you're happily married. And she stands and she goes, and she's carrying on about stories all the time. And I think, I've got to actually take note of this. And she goes, I'm a widow. And I said, oh, I have a message for you. I said, you part of my story I said, it's very interesting that you stood next to me talking about stories, 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 stories. Because that's something God's talking to me about right now. And I've got a, an entry in my journal that I want to send you because I wrote, one minute you're a widow, and two years later you're happily married. So even if you're hurting right now, and even if you can't ever imagine it, I want you just to give this word to the Lord that maybe there's going to be something for you. And she was like, uh and got tears in her eyes. And I'm like, your Lord, you, you're, you're starting soon. You're going for it. I've only just been scribbling some stuff down. <laughs> and you, you're already doing your thing, you know? And all that that takes is in a shop, maybe telling someone your story. Maybe your best friend hasn't heard your story. Maybe your co-worker at work hasn't heard your God story. I had a co-worker who was losing her job. Kingfisher closed for a short time. And she needed a job. And we were sitting having a meeting. We were at Brioche Food and Coffee, a whole lot of us just having a meeting about where we're going, what we're doing. And she got a message on her phone. And that message said, the Ark, which is that place, that furniture place in Balkans, the Ark um, want you to come for a... Uh, no, it was a friend of hers that had organized an interview for her at the Ark. She said, I've got an interview at the Ark. And I said to her, oh, my word. God's putting you on an Ark. And he's going to keep you afloat. And he's going to bring you back. You're only going to be there. You're going to get the job. But you're only going to be there for a little while. And she went, I think you're right. Do you know that she got the job? She was kept afloat. And she came back. And she's working there today. And so that became part of her bio. That became part of her God story. And I was part of the story. And everyone listening was part of the story. Because that's the thing with your stories. And when God's involved, it involves other people. It builds their faith, which is the very thing that Judy was speaking about. Our faith needs to be built. But it doesn't come from some half looted theology degree. It comes from just finding out that that pencil, that was from him. And that he's there for me. And that if he knows what I want, and he isn't always going to give you what you want, you know. Those diamond earrings, maybe not. <laughs> but he's going to supply your needs according to his riches. When I think about that moment, you know, where God was making man and woman, and I think about the intimacy, just that intimacy of God and the man and the woman in the garden. And I always think of intimacy. Have you heard of people saying it's into me see? Intimacy is into me see. You've got a God that 
into UCs. You've got to go seek out some into, into UC. You've got to go and write your bio. Go write the good stuff. Go write the bad stuff. And write the God stuff. And go share the God stuff. And get rid of some of the bad stuff. Maybe you're living with a man and you're not married to him. Maybe you're doing the same thing over and over again. That's against what God says. Maybe you're just not living the life that he has relayed out. If that's you, take a stand because you know who's hanging out when you're looking in the mirror just behind you, the serpent. So who's going to be your king? Who's going to be the one you listen to? Because remember that he's clever. But you serve this unchanging God. And I loved what Judy was saying about being 60 60, 61, and going, right, what do you got for me? Doesn't that make you feel amazing? That you don't, you don't only have to worry about it once you've left school, you know? There's no retirement with God. Nothing. There's no retirement village. If you're living in a retirement village, constantly con- moaning about the fact that there's a water crisis, the municipality has collapsed, there are potholes, there's load shedding. Look, I can carry on. <laughs> you know what? It's going to eventually change. Either get worse or better. I don't know. The thing that you need to be talking about in your old age home is your God story. The thing that you need to be talking about at varsity, your God story. Bring it in. He is this unchanging being, and he is ready to write more stories through you. You're a powerhouse. And I'm going to put something out there right now. On Kingfisher FM, I'm starting a series called The God Story. I went looking for yellow pencils, and I said, God, if I can't find yellow pencils, I trust that you're going to provide purple ones. Uh, Do you ever see a purple HB? I don't ever. And all that I could find were purple ones. Okay? Now, I'm going to say something to you, woman. There, I'm going to start a little series on the station, just five minutes, ten, where you have a chance to come and tell your God story. It's going to be conversational, it's going to be relaxed, it's going to be easy. I want you to ask God right now, am I one of those? If you are one of those, you're going to come and collect, there are 12 purple pencils. You're going to come and collect a purple pencil. And you're going to say, okay, God, I think I might just have a story to tell that can encourage other people. And you know what? I'm going to go home with this pencil. I'm going to sit down with a book. I'm going to find a journal. And I'm going to write some of the stuff. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to choose to encourage someone via the airwaves. I I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. It's waiting for you. The pencils are here. The first two pencils are going to go one to Liesl. You're going to come on air and you're going to tell your God story about this conference and what he did. And the other one is to you, Judy. You're going to come in and you're going to tell your God story. My first little God story, yes, I was stuck in Manhattan. People have had way worse in gangland Some people live in gangland. Some people have much more hectic stories. But you know what? Very often, though, it's the ordinary little things that capture our hearts. So, I don't know where we're going from here. But this is waiting for you, and I'm waiting for you. And if you want to come and collect your pencil, you've got time. (laughs) woo hoo 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 Come, ladies. Yes, 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 yes. You got a question? What happened to the yellow pencil? Look, I carried a, that yellow pencil. That yellow pencil was used. This lady wants to know what happened to the yellow pencil. It was used in my journal for a long, long time until it was a stompy. <laughs> and not one of those that you smoke. And now I still go looking for them, and I still try and keep them around. So, yeah. 
Thank you, ladies. You are awesome. I love being here.